hugs. How's everybody doing tonight? Thanks for coming. Happy New Year. Um, this is uh, this is really exciting because it's the fourth year that we've been doing this uh, series called Curators in Conversation. Uh, it's where me and uh, my colleague Andrew Rabada, who's the uh, newly anointed associate curator, of course he's not here to like accept the accolades. Anyway, we've been uh, for four years doing these. Uh, talks with um, curators, mostly curators, sometimes an artist in our uh, community, and you know, it's sort of the usual thing where they get up there and talk about <clears throat> their work. We try to go a little bit deeper than that, uh, or f at least further back in terms of their personal history, and try to get uh, these curators to talk about um, you know their, their their early lives and how they got into art and stuff. And that's what we're going to be doing today with Bob Lee, who's very uh, well-known and very important in the history of um, not just Asian American art, but art in Chinatown American art. Um, and you're going to find out all about him, so I'm not going to I'm not gonna read any kind of bio, okay? This whole thing is essentially a bio of uh, Bob Lee. So, Bob, you ready to start? Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm Bob Lee. I've uh, been in Chinatown, what, 68, around there. And um, I've sort of... Wait, from where though? Like, where'd you come from? Um, yeah, so I'm from Newark, New Jersey. Grew up there. Went to school out there, to Rutgers. And um, um, I'm born and raised in America. So my father is, you can say, is, or I am second generation, but because my great-grandfather gave the laundry that our, our family had uh, to my father, you might say that I'm fourth generation. And so that's the detail. Um, I guess I feel very different here because this is probably the first of all the curators that have been interviewed here. Someone of my generation, mostly young curators. So looking back at what I've tried to do is sort of my chance to give a different kind of spiel anyway. And uh, where you, like her, like to do is start off with my childhood which was in Newark, New Jersey. So Newark was uh, a very big Chinatown a long time ago. Uh, my father's generation in the 30s uh, had a friend who, whose sole job uh, to make a living was to drive people from Newark Airport to Newark Chinatown uh, because they came to gamble in Newark. Uh, so by the time I came around, most of Brook Chinatown was decimated by parking lots because the mayors of New Jersey, of Newark, uh, tried to get rid of the gambling and uh, turn it all like that so that most of the people fled uh, Newark Chinatown to come to New York City. So New York City's Chinatown got bigger. Uh, there were huge restaurants in the middle of Newark. I never saw them. Uh, but uh, during the Depression and during the war, they were um, hit with various kinds of you know, discrimination. Um, so our laundry, my father's laundry, was, which is I'm standing in front of there, 56 Foot Street, was uh, uh, about five blocks from where Chinatown was. And when I'd go to school, I'd have to walk through Chinatown to the Ironbound, where uh, my grade school and high school were located. So um, our generation was pretty small. We had very few uh, growing up at that time. But my sister's generation was quite large, 30, 40 kids uh, always uh, going um, bowling on Route 22, uh, coming out of the Army or the Navy or the Air Force with their uniforms, looking very spiffy, uh, and then driving my sister's 
to Lonnie's um, in, in Watt Street here uh, to have a hamburger where you could get American food in the middle of Watt Street. So, um, and once in a while I tag along and go to Lonnie's and that's where I bumped into the first English language monthly newsletter uh, that Dallas Chang's daddy put out back in those days. So you hear all the gossip about Chinatown yeah. in English. That generation of so many Chinese in North uh, would always go to uh, Old First Church on uh, Broadway, on Broad Street. And uh, they, on, Saturday, on Thursday night, they had this huge basketball game. And me and my friend, who were maybe five or 10 years old, uh, would try to duck out from these guys who were sweating like hell, <coughs> running, trampling down the basketball field in the church, having this all-out game. Uh, that was the generation that was older than us. And uh, years later, I came across, I think actually recently, there was an article in the New York Times about the Kaidoi generation. So that there was a generation before our generation that were seen as not traditional Chinese, but they were seen as naughty boys or kaidoi generation, who recently had this article in the New York Times about how they now have a banquet, they get together and uh, speak about how they were different from the other Chinese, the, the older generation. Uh, in Chinatown. So I guess that would be um, the generation that my father was a part of, uh, if you see him there, and how I felt so totally different from him. Your dad was born, was born in China, right? Yeah, he didn't come here until 14, right? 14, 13, 14, like that. And why, why did he come over? Well, um, he came over as a paper son, um, and so he filled out those papers which said he was a Lee, when he's actually an Aang. Uh, and uh, a friend of mine recently found his testimony on um, files from uh, Ellis Island that was about Yo Thick. Uh, so he was able to get into the country, and then his grand, his great is not his father, but his grandfather was had this laundry that then he inherited. So and that's why he that's why he moved to the U.S. was to work in the laundry. I room. think I know he never, he never spoke very much, but I would think that he, like most immigrants in those days, came here because of the economic hardship going on in Toisan, and people had to send money back to Toysan in order for them to survive. So that's why most people came here. He never actually told you that you're kind of... Yeah, because you all I know about Chinese American history, um, my, my parents would hardly ever tell us about no. those kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. Like most parents, they... Uh, so we uh, would go to Old First Church, and I remember once in a while I would try to find out well, you know, what religion are we, really? What is your, what kind of religion did you have in China? And they would never tell me that. They wanted me to become American. They wanted me to not know particularly about Chinese ghosts. And I would find out a little bit here and there, bump into it here and there. But they would never want to tell me about Toy San and um, the ghost stories that I didn't, didn't hear peep about when I was younger, much older than you begin to hear a little bit about admitting that they, you know, had some experience with ghosts in China or in the Toysan village. Um, what about your, your mom? How did they, how did your parents meet? Was it in America? Or? Um, it was a fixed marriage. My mother would always complain that my father, who was doing very well in Bakersfield, in California, uh, took her and uh, one of her many, many brothers to China and fixed her up 
and she heard about somebody who was looking at it through the school class and realized that she was doing stuff with this who she didn't know. And this guy was eyeing her. Uh, she was very upset. Uh, but her brother told her, your rice is cooked. Uh, so that's done. <laughs> thing to say? That was, that was their story. And, uh, I'm using that. I'm using that. Yeah. So she, you know, had my older sister in China, and then when she came to America from Cal California, and then over into Newark, and found out that her life was going to be spent in this laundry on Court Street was. Not very happy. <laughs> Coming from California, where all these fruits and vegetables hanging from the tree, was her experience in, in the United States. And I, I'm still not clear as whether she was born in China or born in Bakersfield. Um, but uh, that that she was more Americanized, in other words. and her joy and her happiness and was just uh, the keynote of my childhood and what, how I felt about, about everything. Um, because he was, my father was quite, how would you say, this uh, quiet person who hardly said anything. The one thing I would always, that my mother always used to complain about is, he's off to the track again, you know, right on this horse. Um, but uh, once in a while, he'd come back and give us a little piece of what he wanted. But it was amazing that it was awesome when he would suddenly take a certain kind of posture and realize he was going to say something to you. <coughs> oh, you better listen and stand still and wait for what he was going to suddenly come out with. And it wasn't, you know, one or two words or a few sentences, but it would always utterly impress me as being, where is this coming from? It, it was filled with incredible insight and, and uh, knowledge and understanding, even though he never finished school. So it wasn't until much later, when I'm much more an adult, uh, that I realized um, that he had a very philosophical kind of what, what you, I think I read a recent book about philosophy that it's meant for not academics or specialists, but it, philosophy is supposed to be for everybody to think about our existence. And certainly he was that kind of person. Um, he was incredibly insightful. Um, but on the other hand, it was clear to me that I could never follow this guy, that I am born to be an American, and he's coming from an utterly different place. So um, that was really key to how I grew up. And. Um he worked in a laundry. Did you work there also sometimes? Did you go? Sometimes, but my daughters, my sisters got the brunt of it. My two sisters had to work in the laundry when we apparently were doing wholesale. And so they would all talk to me about, oh, this table is five, is three by six, and it was piled with socks this high, and how many hours they would stand there. By the time I came of age to work there, we were no longer doing wholesale business. So I only had these little bit of socks to fall <laughs> And uh, I, I, I don't think I ever ironed shirts, but I did some things. Um, so they would always complain that I had it easy. <laughs> um, so I want to uh, sort of move, jump ahead a little bit, um, talk about uh, college days and kind of your, what your growing interests were. like. When, uh, you know, kind of when you were seeking out, either culturally or, or otherwise, you went to Rutgers, right? Right. I went to Rutgers. Uh, I was into physics. 
I learned down in New Brunswick how disappointed I was in what physics turned out to be. And uh, I uh, decided to take a summer course uh, at Rutgers North, where, you know, back in North, where I could just go home to the laundry and, and go to school. And I bumped into this professor. His name was George Weber. And uh, if I say to you he was awesome, that he blew me away, um, that would be an understatement. Uh, he was all inspiring. Uh, a, a, a gentleman who knew exactly who and what he was and what his intention was. Um, so what, what year was this? You were in college? 62. I started, um, and he, how I bumped into him, I don't know why, I, why am I the only Asian American seeing this guy, um, he was an authority on Chinese bronzes of the late Joe period. Um, so if you know Chinese history, um, the Xia, the dynasties and then the mid, early, middle, and late Zhou. Um, and uh, people like myself would go to his studio and he might ask us to help him draw these diagrams about the ornaments on the, the bronzes, which you'll see later. Um, anyway, it was a very unusual art education in that uh, he would not use any textbooks. I'm so happy that at Rutgers, New Brunswick, they were using, they weren't using Gardner, they were using another more recent one, I can't remember the name now. But he would not use any textbook. Um, we would study stone, bronze, and iron age before we moved into the bronze age, and then into the migration peoples, which I'll tell you more about, and then stop and let some other professor tell you about the Renaissance and things like that. He would jump right into Picasso. So, uh, what was it he, about his, you know, teaching style or what he had to say that was so inspiring to you? Like, was it his style or was it the way he, what was it? He had a presence which would just knock us off our chairs and he would, be able to do that whenever he wanted. Um, he was also someone like my father who was had very few things to say. He would simply communicate without words to you. Um, pardon, me, you know. So um, this is interesting. Like your, you, know, you said, your dad wouldn't talk about. Or your family went talking about like the superstitions, you know, that they grew up with, and that sort of like the ancient culture of China. But then this George Weber kind of filled it in a little bit. Maybe. What do you think? What you say? What What I tried to describe, or what I thought about, is how to let you know about this, and that is, it's like being on a bridge. Um, the traffic is going one way, and the other traffic is going this way, right? I'm going that way to the United States, and he's going the other way to China. And I was in a position to try to make sense of that, and it took many years before I could finally get a clue as to what that all meant. So my understanding of Asian America is to be able to with that experience, see it in both directions. Uh, in, a, in more than just an utterly intellectual know, it's more than personal to understand what that is about. And so that's sort of where, where I'm coming from. Uh, it, it's because of what I could understand he was thinking to this country by bringing Chinese culture here. And the, another way you could say
made is that I, I've met some people and they're telling me about that generation of sinologists who did all these incredible independent individual things. They're not, from what I understand, not like any of the sinologists of this generation. Um, he crossed over. And when I mean cross over, if you're an anthropologist and you study a culture and you know you're the difference, you're a scientist and they are the people. And there's a point where they are the people and their knowledge and insight, how and in what way you cross over to become a part of their culture um, is perhaps unethical for a scientist, but not for an artist. And he was an artist as well. And, and there was all this work that we saw of his, and something like that. But, so he did something incredibly unusual. And I was there. I, 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 it, it was something that I had to um, witness and try to make sense of it in the context of my own life and experience. So um, I, and go ahead. Is it, so was it through him that, and his class that, you know, you, you did that convince you that you should follow, uh, like pursue art as a Oh, I, I immediately life. became an art major. Oh. And uh, he, 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 I couldn't move from one school to the other until my, south, my junior year. Uh, and I took every class I could with him and uh, was overly, um, uh, what? I, I didn't have a secondary fallback plan. I just went totally for art. So all the studio classes, all the history classes, uh, so art history making, classes. You were making art at that time. Oh yeah, I had, I had, you know, what is that? Painting, drawing, uh, printmaking, no. uh, all those studio classes. I made masks, uh, uh, pottery, things, all kinds of things. Um, so what was the subject matter that that you were uh, exploring? Well, or you just what I mentioned is, is that this version of art history, jumping from this, these time, ancient times uh, into modern times, um, and, and into uh, the, the period that is mostly unknown, which is the migration periods. So, um, I've had many decades to mull over what the hell was that class about migration he was all about. Why was he giving that? Um, and so one year next to the Met on Madison Street, uh, I came across a book. There's a big gallery, I think it's still there. They have a, this large book about the fibula pins that migration people, so all the different diverse nomadic migration peoples would have, they all wore different fibula pins. And there's an exhibition underneath the stairs in the Met where you can see them. Um, and uh, the book preface starts off in saying that uh, you are now looking at the history of the art of the missing, what's missing in the history of the West. This is a story that these art projects are reflection of a story that is not told. And if you understand that, uh, you understand that a lot of the peoples who were nomadic, oral tradition, uh, coming into the, what is now the West and sacking Rome uh, on their soft, swift ponies that would run circles around the Roman large horses. Uh, those people were um, uh, inundated by both Christianity and a literary culture. Um, so they were 
it was illegal for them to wear their former fibula pins. They had to wear Christian uh, jewelry or objects. Um, that is what we are told is the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. Uh, what really happened there is part of one of the stories that have preoccupied me as a nonprofit, not as a scholar, as a curator, uh, not as a historian, someone who's not going to get into all the languages that are spoken there. So um, to try to understand the first encounter between people with Asian elements in their culture, which with these my, not all, but many of these nomadic peoples, uh, what is it? What do they see? How are we perceived as Asians? What does Asians mean, Oriental? Uh, when that kind of, of development took place, the first encounter that they began to see what is, what is Asian to them, and how that got suppressed. I, okay, I use the word suppressed, but maybe there's another, other, lots of different words we can say it. But the West emerges and becomes and defines itself in a very different way. But that all those horses and all the aristocracy and blue blood of Europe, how much do they owe to the traditions who were these migra migratory nomadic people who often had bellicose or warlike uh, aspects to their culture. This is the story of the West that is not told. And if you caught Michael Woods on PBS 10, 15 years ago, talking about the barbarian West, how this story is uh, not told, because you, you don't want to call the West barbarian in 10th century AD, uh, 10 to 15th century AD. So this is a very controversial period. And when we did an exhibition on this story uh, in, two, in 1992, the quincentennial of Christopher Columbus, we did an exhibition and I contacted a historian about this and he said he's a specialist in the migratory people saying that you can no longer get a degree in studying the migratory history. You can only get, get your PhD in one small area. They won't let you study the whole thing. And they won't let you study it in terms of the art objects, the fibula pens that I got to study. I mean, I think it's really interesting when you're kind of connecting this kind of Asian American um, identity and culture to something that's very, very, very old and to these encounters between uh, the West and Asia um, that are very far removed from like your experience here in, you know, Newark and then and in Chinatown. So, so, but I, so I wanted to skip even further ahead to like, you know, Chinatown, uh, meeting Eleanor, maybe the uh, basement workshop and your involvement in that. And what, you know, kind of like what, uh, what that was like in, in Chinatown yeah. culture. I, before I leave that, then um, uh, it's that um, when I was interviewed, when 9 11 happened, and people were writing all these books about Chinatown, and one of them came to me and said, what's the key factor in trying to bring Chinatown back from the disaster of 9-11? And I told him, it's how we are perceived. How does this country perceive us as Asian Americans? And that is more central than our economy, uh, than our um, than all the jewelry, 70% of the jewelry stores got crushed not only 65% of all the garment factories. But what we did in this country is essentially as Asians because of how we are perceived. And so to me, the first encounter of how did that perception come
come about and to look for evidence of that in these ancient times to see how that evolved. So that's why I went there. But when you come to, you know, basement workshop, I graduated from Rutgers without any notion about who the hell I was. And it's only because of basement workshop uh, that the idea that we are Asian Americans, that took us a month to figure out that name, those two words, put a hyphen there and say, oh, we're hyphen, we're Asian hyphen American. And then later, a few months later, Asian Pacific Americans. Um, so that, that that idea, this is who we are, this is what we want to demonstrate on the streets, uh, around the time that Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were shot, I mean, Kennedy, um, John Kennedy was shot, well, that sense of collectively why our community is important to us, important to us uh, that all comes from basement, and that's something that Danny admits now, um, having this huge book coming out on him in a, in a year or two. Uh, normally he would always talk about how basement is a collective. Who's, who's Danny? Uh, Danny Young was the founder of Basement Workshop. And uh, a lot of the papers that we have in our storage, in the Art Center's storage, uh, my wife is now going through all of them. And uh, it confirms how much he has worked on uh, and developed the whole idea and purpose and goal and, and was the director of Basement for so many years before Faye took over. So how many of us owe our perception of our community and our, of ourselves to his work? Now, of course, the West Coast had their own development. But on the East Coast, Danny was really seminal. How did you meet him? Uh, he was just hanging around, you know. We, just, we were all on Elizabeth Street, that, in that basement that he found. And we were bringing file cabinets there, and everybody was hanging around, having a good time. And we all wanted to do what the Black Panthers did, help our community. We didn't have guns, but we, we, we saw our mission to support our community. Our community had hardly any social services at all. It was still in that time of being a docile, harmless community that had good food. Um, and so <laughs> this is we, what we realized, all these difficulties, uh, because he did all this research uh, and asked all these questions and came out with his thesis of all these answers of how much needs our community had. Uh, so getting involved there, getting involved in IWK, one of the many, many political organizations in Chinatown spouting radical politics. I was closely involved there. And then also in the health clinic. Health clinic, when we moved to 22 Catherine Street, was on the second floor. Um, basement was on the third floor. Um, and Ida BK was under the bridge on uh, Henry Street. But uh, those involvements, particularly, say, the health fair, I think in 72, I designed a poster for that. I don't have a picture of that. But uh, uh, Regina and I have been talking about this, who is now just retired from the Chinatown Health Center. Um, and. Uh, so this was a, a, a moment of, uh, we were all volunteers. Uh, and we were, that's what we wanted to do. And a few of us managed, I guess I managed, to find a way to make a living out of being a volunteer and working for the good of our community. Um, and how did all this lead to Asian American Art Center? Um, well, uh, 
a, Bateman wasn't a rough at that point. There, there were lots of different programs, whether it's having an annual film festival or all kinds of things dealing with video, or putting out Bridge Magazine, or a, 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 there's a group that handles, helps our little kids, the underground children. It's now, it still exists. Um, there were so many groups under that umbrella. Uh, one of them was my wife's dance company. Um, well, it was an Asian American dance workshop, I think, at that point, which <coughs> changed to Asian American dance theater uh, in 74, when we split off the basement. But a lot of the groups, um, I, I guess one of the myths and romances of basement workshop is that how you know wonderful it was at the time. Uh, I, I need to say a few words about what the reality is and all the documents that we have and are now sharing with people who are doing their PhD on the history of basement workshop, of how the foreign born and the American born uh, had how all these differences. Foreign born was going to leave, quit, and walk out after one year. Uh, that line is not so clear. You know, there's mixed people on both sides. But um, there are all these papers that document how difficult it was. One of the difficulties were these three, four hour meetings, five hour meetings about Mao Zedong and everything else under the sun, revolution and all, um, that would bring all these different groups who have all these projects that they want to work on, having to sit through these meetings. So lots of us spun off. Basement Workshop was this great place where you nurture a project and then it spins off and becomes its own thing. So we spun off, the dance company spun off in 74. This organization spun off in 78. Um, and um, our first two years doing a lot of our the contemporary dance programs and traditional dance programs were taking place in Chatter Square Library on the fourth floor, I believe, where you can you know, do things. And then we finally found a home in two years later, 76, uh, on 26 Bowery, where we had, I had the gallery uh, for since, for how many years? 76 to 2010. Um, and that's where um, there was a CEDAR program that President Johnson started and maybe close to 100 of us got a job at CETA for a year or two. And I was in charge of the art program. Uh, and so when Johnson left and the program collapsed, I moved the, the art program to Asian American Dance Theater, which uh, took us a few years before we changed our name to Asian American Art Center. Uh, to oversee both the dance component and the visual arts component. I'm curious about the name, you know, Asian American Arts Center. Was it something that was, uh, there's a lot of debate, either within yourself or with others, about what to call this place for contemporary art? It took us a, at least a month or two, I remember how pissed off we were that uh, we couldn't come up with a really snazzy name. Yeah. And we had to to resign ourselves to this mundane thing <laughs> that, uh, oh, I forgot to say, you know, the name Asian American when the movement first started was something that we were going to say to the press when we're doing demonstrations on the street. So we could not call ourselves Tong Yang Gai, which was the typical <laughs> name on Mott Street, to say that, oh, we are the sweet people street in Tong Yang Gai. No, we had to figure out a name that the government and the press would use to call us, which is Asian Americans. So the same thing, we had this kind of straight-laced name that we had, we couldn't agree on something that would be more snazzy. 
Um, that's how the name came about. And what was the, you know, your intentions in the, in the beginning like? What was the mission as you saw it back then? Actually, I don't know if I talk about the mission <laughs> yeah. uh, of, the, of the dance company. Uh, you know, my, my mission immediately was to start an archive because I knew nobody would now, or at that time we started, be interested in Asian American artists or art. And we were doing it for the future to lay, to lay a groundwork so that people could know what Asian American artists were doing back in those early days. So the exhibition program started with an archive program which collecting names and information and data uh, started in 82. The first exhibition didn't start until 83. Uh, but uh, what was that first show? First the first show was called Eye to Eye <coughs> and we had uh, a big panel discussion with John Yao and um, other important art historians, Lucy the Park is there. John Yao. John Yao. It was Lucy the Park, David Yao, Lady Oakmore. My artist in residence yeah. <laughs> in that day. Um, but what one of the things that John Yao was part of was the discussion that. You know, I don't remember if he was there or wasn't there, but uh, that came about because that took up the whole night, um, which was an artist called John Yao and said, uh, this white guy just walked out of my show. I have this installation in the middle of the room. He looked at my name and saw that, you know, my Chinese name, and he walked out. He said, that's not possible. No Chinese does contemporary art. And so he left, so the artist called John Yao, what should I do, should I change my name? Mm -hmm. Changing your name became the discussion for the whole night, for another hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking about whether we should or should not change your name. We have a picture, I put it on my blog, you can go see it. It looks like uh, Ted Ching CS sitting right next to you when you're yeah, invited them. Lit into the, and he is there hearing this, so he changed his name from, um, what's his English name, uh, Sammy Chen, he changed it to Te Ching Xie. And that's been the ten trend for how many years now, is to use your original name, even though Americans can't pronounce it or understand it, or even consider you in the marketplace because they can't figure out your name. Uh, so that's one of the that's, that's what happened on the first meeting of getting all these Asian American artists together, about 100 people in the room. Um, and so this was the beginning of Asian American art. And, and this is what I'm, one of the things I'm trying to say to you is that Asian American art came about because I had now seen what a scholar artist could do and have meaning for Asian. I wanted to see what Asian American artists themselves were doing with that. And that's why I started this whole direction. Maybe one more question for me is, um, uh, how, did, how did it work with the programming at the Asian American Arts Center? Um, you know, how did you plan exhibitions? And uh, you know, who, was, who was the sort of final decision maker? And, how did you, how did all the artists, you know, how did you meet artists and what was the community like? Just curious about the whole kind of scene around the art center. At that, at that it was stage. really a community scene. It, it was not a Soho or East Village scene at all. We were involved with, with being Asian American and the Chinatown and the Chinese uh, experience. Um, uh, so, it was also a scene where the funding, the government funding that s suddenly became available uh, because of places like Basement Workshop, that funding, from what I understand it, 
uh, begins in 68 with the, the street riots or uprising in all that hot summer in Watts, Chicago, Newark, New Jersey, where I'm from. It was that kind of uprising during this whole tumultuous period that the, the New York State Council of the Arts starts this program initially, initially called Ghetto Arts. <coughs> And in Washington, really? D.C. at NEAS, it wasn't called Special Arts Program, it was called Ghetto Arts. And in Washington, D.C., it was called Expansion Arts. Uh, that's the beginning of funding for community, communities of color. Uh, and so, basement gets a chance to jump on that at that time. And the peanuts that you get continue to be peanuts, peanuts for many, many years. So what the, one of the answers to your question is that it's the whole structure of what you're trying to do is shaped because you only got peanuts. You can't do as much as like what you're doing now here in this place, in this building, with these facilities and everything that you have here. There's no way you could do that. But you you would it was the beginning and so you sacrificed and went and tried to do that. Those days. So you meet artists helter skelter. You just jump into it. You you don't go get an MA in how to run nonprofit organizations. It's useless, <laughs> worse than useless, waste of time. You just jump in and find out what the ropes are. You find out what the reality is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't suggest you go to nonprofit now, but in those days, you know, of course. Uh, you had, this is the road, the road that was open to you. So, and the idea that Asian American art is a special kind of genre. What are the issues in there? So I used to describe it as a kind of, you went to a press conference, you announced who you were, and now you're stuck with this name that the public knows you by, and you draw a certain boundary. What is that? What's inside there? and you try to explore what is Asian American art? What does it mean to women? What does it mean to guys? What does it mean to Toy San, to Chinese, to Filipino, to... So we, in those beginning days, we were Pan-Asian. There was no Indians, uh, uh, Dominic, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hawaiians, Asians from, from Canada, we were in one boat. We, in Basin, we had a guy named Christian. He was a white guy. He served in Vietnam. He was really a part of everything we were. We were together. Um, and and, and ex exploring what that togetherness means, what we had in common, how we felt like Carlos Bulusan, betrayed by this country. Uh, what were we going to make of that? How were we going to grow and develop? All those things begin to take shape as themes for shows that I sought to do. <coughs> much respect, Bob. That's um, much respect. Oh, that's incredible. Well, that, um, it's, 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 it's history now, and, and I wanted to, because they were so many of the young people that you interviewed, there were questions from the audience about Asian American art, and you know a lot of the young curators who were being able to find a way to get into the mainstream, Asian American art is not part of the mainstream, so there's nothing much to say. But because I had the real opportunity, and I'm very thankful for that, uh, to focus on something that I felt close to, and to spend most of my life doing it, I, I, I have all this to say about perhaps some uh, curiosity as to what is Asian American art, what has it been, and where is it going? So, um, so I want to, this is what I have available to me, what I can contribute to the future of cur Asian curators and and to our community and what uh, 
where you know these other questions lead us to. Yeah, maybe we should go through some slides and then um, see if the audience has any yeah. questions and kind of move the conversation along. You want to um, click through it? Awesome. Just that? Yeah, that right side. Right side. We've got to go through them pretty quick. Go through Time's not on our side. So here's Eleanor, my wife, who in 71 was working with Basement Workshop and doing a program uh, in Midtown. Um, and that flyer, we have a copy of the flyer in our office. It still exists, uh, promoting New York the Chinese way. Um, so this is Danny Young, the guy who started Basement Workshop. Uh, this cartoon figure, Tian Tian Xing Xing, um, he was drawing that back in the late 60s. And continuing to do that through his career uh, until, I don't know what year this was, he had, uh, he's become such a famous artist now uh, that uh, the several exhibitions, both in Shanghai, Beijing, Taiwan, where they erected these uh, statues of Chen Chen Xing Xing. The one in Beijing you're looking at is about 25, 30 feet tall, and his he has like two, three hundred of these little guys, about two feet tall, uh, where 20, 30, 40 artists in Singapore, Mexico, Toronto have created their own art on his, uh, what is this called, blank boy canvas. This was our original sign made of walnut, it was two inches thick, um, that we would put on the Bowery, 26th Bowery. And so this was when our name was in two parts, before it became that boring old name. Um, <laughs> I like how American kind of goes. Right, like, <laughs> yeah. I still have that somewhere in storage. So we had a little thing there where we could post our current events. Um, this is 26 Bowery. This is 26 Bowery, uh, which then got bought by this other uh, he was a Jewish landlord at first. So we had art classes back then. Evelyn Lee, Lee, still living in Chinatown, was an, an art therapist. This sign only lasted for a month or two <coughs> when we changed our name to this, uh, uh, you know, umbrella name. Um, because my landlord broke it, uh, his gang on Hell Street. Smashed it. Um, so there's. Uh, the landlord was a gang. Right? Yeah, my landlord was hip sing. And the article about the clash between the art center and hip sing when they threatened my father's life and all this other kind of stuff. The only thing I promise to say is that if you want to read about the story, you go to the um, the New York the New Yorker magazine. Uh, June 17th, 1991, on page 75. Or you can get her book, Gwen Kincaid, who dug up all this dirt about Chinatown. And the New Yorker refused to take my ad to tell, so I could tell some good stories about the culture of Chinatown. So here's my wife, uh, oh. Eleanor, doing dance <laughs> on the Town Square Library. Uh, back in 74, when we split off. Chatham Square Library, very uh, important cultural space, and right? Free space. Yeah, like this museum uh, did exhibitions there. Yes, we all did things there on the fourth floor. It was very important. So this is one of the masks that I made for the dance company back in those days. Um, so every year we were part of the Kappa Heritage Festival for more than 30 years probably. Um, this is one of the folk artists we presented. So all of our shows were on contemporary art except for the Lunar New Year show. That's where we would get into traditional folk art and how we eventually got into 
uh, Uncle Ang Shang Si, so his book is out there. Uh, Uncle Ang comes to America, where he sings toy song, uh, Mokyu song. So I guess he's going to come up soon, right? Yeah. So here are some of the uh, some of the artists who come from China and visit and want to have a show with us. They bring gifts, which are very nice. These are replica bronzes. The original bronze is probably quite large. Uh, um, and um, they're, they're, the bronze that they're made of is not quality bronze, so they, these things do break. But they are replicas, and they have the exact proportions of what these bronze were. So there's the Tao Te mask on the side of the bronze, and you get into uh, this early history, and um, I'd like to say a few things about this, one more thing about this early history is that you begin to perceive um, what came before the Bronze Age, the Stone, Bronze, and Iron Age, and the peoples who invented, you know, um, uh, domesticated the horse, uh, they were hunter-gatherers, and uh, they changed into these people living on the plains. And that, that culture from those early times that I'm so happy this year, last year, to find that I'm not the only one fascinated and wondering about these early encounters between things that might be perceived as Asia, people uh, practicing rituals, shamanistic rituals, uh, Sufi rituals, are alive today in Kazakhstan, and uh, the the uh, Asian um, Contemporary Art Week curator Lisa Amadi just had a show in Jersey City of a living group in Kazakhstan named Red Tractor, uh, presenting these people who are still enmeshed in these nomadic traditions. Um, who are into commenting, their artwork, commenting on our contemporary modern way of life. This is a kind of dialogue which is expanding what contemporary art dialogue is about. And I feel it's, it's really brings another dimension to what art history is. Uh, we had a lot of fun <laughs> at times. Uh, this is where my staff got really excited about um, putting together a group of a lot of friends who did um, participate in the Chinese New Year Parade. Uh, and this is a winning hand, of course. I, I'm not a Mahjong person, so I can't tell you what hand it is. Maybe somebody out there can recognize this winning hand. Um, so here's Uncle Eng. Uh, and I saw him when he won the National Heritage Award in Washington, go down to Washington, accept the award, and with 700 of these Washington bureaucrats required to attend this event, where 13 uh, American folk artists were being given an award. They were all sitting there when he sang to them, uh, and he, you know, he created this song. Uh, thank you for the award. I hope you all get a promotion. <laughs> uh, if it wasn't a standing ovation of these people, they blew away my camera sound equipment, so it, it couldn't catch the thunderous applause. But I was so struck how a farm, uneducated farmer, with such so much experience performing before a Chinese audience was able to blow away an American audience. His, his authentic charm. What is possible of, in Chinese culture to do that? He was an example of that. And I, unfortunately, he was, by that time he was too old, I couldn't tour him around the country and get him to do that all over the place. So we, you know, the, the gallery, uh, 26 Bowery, was used for many, many things. Uh, weddings and other things, and we were very happy to be part of the community in that sense. Here is an event where Danny comes back and has uh, a lot of his friends get together. 
welcome him because he's traveling all over the world all the time now. He's quite an important figure, even a kind of art diplomat who brings people together in both the theater world and uh, other aspects of the arts. Another Asian contemporary art, how it's becoming uh, a global phenomenon. So one of the things that I've been very active with is uh, uh, advocating for the arts and how I would, you know, for so many years, doing all these kinds of advocacy in New York City especially. Uh, TAC was a very important experience for nine, ten years for me, giving me a global perspective. But, uh, or not, not a global, but a, um, a national perspective. So, um, but one of the things I would say to you guys is that we've experienced, like the black community, 40 years of the banks redlining of their community, how that affected their whole development for the last 15 years. We're, we have now experienced with the with de Blasio 40 years of redlining the people of color's culture. We have been under the thumb of, of their politics. And it just continues, even with this mayor. Uh, if, if our culture is going to be freed, it's got to get out from this monstrosity. Uh, this was uh, a poster, we, one of the first posters we did in 80, 83, 84, no, 84, 85. So we did five of these shows. Um, this one happened with Ai Weiwei among the people we exhibited and he helped me uh, put this together. This is Tokyo Sasaki, one of the early Asian American artists I've exhibited, and how a lot of the energy was put to trying to find uh, images that wouldn't wobble. <laughs> you wanted images that had strength and power, and they don't wobble. Uh, and Toshi was a master at this kind of thing. He uh, later applied to do the World Trade Center. He came out a finalist. You can still see his work uh, on the website talking about all the people who competed for this. Um, so she was relative here? Pardon? No. He's in Colorado. Uh, we were his family. Pardon? We know Toshio's family well. Uh, he has a this piece of Coney Island still out there. We'll see it on the wall. Oh yeah, there's a big long wall against the, the waterfront. He has this huge uh, wall there. I forgot how many feet it's how long it is. Um, this is a a piece by Sokon Choi, which I often bitterly use for our New Year card recently. And, but this is one of the key another key differences for me which is why I've been putting it out there. You know, obviously you can see it's on lotto cards, um, the whole idea of gambling, of risk. But the idea is that this character means mine in Korea, China, Japan, uh, all of East Asia. However, this character is identical to the meaning of heart. And that is those two things are one word, one concept, heart, mind. And that is utterly different. Our traditions are utterly different from what the West has evolved with the breakup of the split between church and state, between the dichotomy, between the mind being superior and the heart being emotional and unreliable. That is a choice each of us can figure out what that means for us. So this is Chen Kong Chi, and after people like uh, Toshio Sasaki, you had people like Chen Kong Chi, hysterical, funny. So Asian Americans can be funny. 
you know, that was that happened pretty not, not a few years, not much long later. Um, he, and there were several people like this that are very important to, uh, for me and and for us, I think. There's Arlen, where's Arlen? There you are. <laughs> there you are. Do you recognize yourself? Arlen on the left. <laughs> and uh, Mark Wong in the gallery. Behind Mark Wong is a picture of his parents, uh, Mark Wong's mother and father, who he painted as if they were on the mural of the Rockefeller Plaza in that style, I've got to name that style that's in the Rockefeller Plaza. Deco. Backyard Deco. And they're both nude uh, on that mural. Um, and this is Se Kyung Khan, also great sense of humor, but also very profound idea of uh, um, these three inch canvases, three inches by three inches. In this case, the show he did for our gallery was all full of these Buddhas. Uh, this is Dali Yunathan from Malaysia, and um, shows she's representing the China and June 4th uh, Tiananmen Square exhibition. Uh, these are, uh, you can see a banner with all these tassels. Uh, the red things that you see going across are sheets of paper, handmade paper. And then the tonality changes from red to black. That is, all that tonality is all handwritten words in, in, her, in the languages over there. Written such to so many times that they form a tone. You can't read them anymore. And it's an incredibly dense, and when she finishes that, she takes it out to the countryside, and I think she has somebody shoot them with, with rifles. So this was her banner for Tiananmen Square, and this is one of the shows that we've had in storage for the last 30 years, and are now finally finding someone who's going to take it on, and keep it visible to the public, and uh, to bring light to what China is doing with human rights. Here's Dali Yunathan. She passed away last year. Um, this was her other show, that she, one of the other shows she was in, called We Count, at the City Hall Gallery on the other side of uh, Chamber Street. Uh, her banner is above her head, where she has about 100 Asian Americans who have been killed by police. Um, and each each of those victims have a little flower on them. Um, this was our 25th anniversary show. Uh, there's Charles Yoon's painting over there that's in our permanent collection. And we have a couple of hundred, if not more, things in our permanent collection, which we are now trying to find new homes for. Uh, and uh, Ken Te Fu shows these figures that he's no longer making sculpture, however. Uh, another artist I wanted to bring attention to was Yoshi, Yoshiki Araki, um, who, uh, the title is Hiroshima Born, the name of the painting and the name of the exhibition. The name of the painting is Mother and Son, done in 1985. The name of the exhibition we gave him, Hiroshima Born, was in 2006. He died about six years before this, uh, being kicked out of his studio and having a ton of work that he was going to bring out, that he had finally realized that Hiroshima was the thing that, that was his main thing and that he was making all this art for. Then his landlord kicks him out. He has no place to bring all his work. He gets sick because the hospital dies. His wife and his friends try to save all of his work, put it in storage. He's pretty much unknown. And yet he is creating work which no one else is going to bring out, which is to help us, or everywhere internationally, come to terms with what Hiroshima really means to who we are 
as humanity. His work is difficult, it's sexy, it's powerful, but this one is probably one of his most powerful. His mother, who walked through Hiroshima the day, the next day, looking for her father, and never found him. This is what Yoshi Araki lived with. And here you see the epitome of, you know, you see those, those marble heads of Roman aristocrats in the Metropolitan Museum. Well, here it is in cotton, light as a feather. This is bringing Asian values and Western values together to the, the realism of the face. Roger Shimomura, he was also in the We Count show. Uh, Rafael Bilal was in the, the show called Detained. Wafa was now so famous because he mounted that online show of where you could shoot an Arab. How many thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, got to shoot an Arab because he, he created this show uh, and you could shoot him in this room that he set up with paintballs, yellow paintballs. You show and his wife, Noriko, when he does, puts on boxing gloves and hits the paper. Um, in 1998, when we did his show, uh, Siri Kintani, her in her hand is this rice that she painted gold. Uh, we did a show on mixed skin. Uh, Tony Thomas uh, did research about families in Newark. Uh, and there was such a family, and they went up to, to interview them, uh, of a, a, a Chinese American who married a black woman, and this and his daughter sitting, standing next to him. And uh, Sin Yin Ho, who does traditional pottery, brings it back to China to fire these things that are six and seven feet tall. And this is one of her pots that we exhibited in 2010. Uh, this is 2009 when Natalie Pham and Navani Patel uh, encircled Columbus Park, uh, mounting all these red panels, AD head panels, all around the park. And every weekend we'd come in with volunteers and move them around and change them. And all the poetry and statements of, of residents and visitors to Chinatown are, are written on these panels. Not artwork, but actually getting the community to talk and listen to it themselves. We did a show in 2015, uh, collaborating with China Rights in, Act in Action and the Feminist Task Force, who were documenting what uh, 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 activist feminists in China were doing all over the country, and how they were organizing, even you know, uh, recently. So the year was five women activists who were put in jail by uh, the current premier. Um, this was when we were going to be evicted and we got a lot of artists to participate. Um, and Ki uh, <coughs> Wang Yang made this plate, this famous rice bowl, uh, about how this kind of landlord process was affecting all of us. And this was just last year, 2018, when Art, Art Across Archives, Think Chinatown, did a, a pop-up show on 384 Broadway. And I got to have a picture here of one of the most, to me, important Asian American artists, Lily Ye, who had an impact on the um, uh, genocide between the Tutsi and Kuti in Rwanda bringing these people together and having all these international diplomats come in and participate in this historic event. So Lily yeah, is not only an artist, but showing how artwork can affect a political situation. Uh, so there we are. Uh, so back. Um, I think you're okay there. Okay. Um, All right. 
So, any it's questions? A, yeah, amazing presentation. Any any questions? Yeah. Do you want, do you want me to say it out loud? Say it out um, so I know that Asian American Art Center was pan-Asian, but I'm going to go into a little bit of Chinese experience specifically. So you're talking about, you know, the 500-year, the, the, the lost ages of migration from, from Asia to the West and the West to Asia and, and kind of like a fluid gap. And, uh, and, and I wanted to know more about your observations with, uh, with like different generations of uh, Chinese American artists or Chinese artists. So there's like, there's obviously a very hot Chinese contemporary art scene right now and, uh, and, and like their response to the Chinese government and the injustices uh, of, um, of like the Chinese government and, and you know human rights abuses, but they're obviously a lot more censored. And uh, and I'm wondering, like, I, I guess I don't really have a question. It's more like, what are your observations of like the, the fluidity between in, in like a global world of uh, Chinese and Chinese American? It's very hard for me to do what I wanted to do, which was to stay away from China and only deal with the American situation about Asian Americans, not. Chinese in China. I did travel to to a lot of different places in Asia, including Korea, back in '95. I witnessed a sudden building of new museums in Hong Kong and Korea, uh, where they were struggling to quick find the artists in, in Hong Kong who we've never paid any attention to at all. Get them up because we're, next year we're going to be part of China. And put them, each one of them had a floor in Hong Kong, a whole floor, something these, uh, these artists had. And the curators were struggling to figure out, what do we say? What do we write about them? How did modernism come to Hong Kong? Same issue in Korea. They didn't know what to write about all these artists they were suddenly fine. They find, of course, after a few years, they very quickly had curators who be able to tell them what to have. But for me, after what? 15, 20 years now, when the multiculturalism for 20 years was the main develop art development in the United States. And then Halakar and other people will say, well, not multiculturalism is now passe because identity can, is fickle, it can change all the time. So now, like I showed you the Korean artist, Sunin Kim, doing that wool face, doing it in Korea. She's not really an Asian American. But that kind of display shows you that what we are dealing with is with Asian Americans. People in Asia all over are dealing with the influx of the Western influence there. So when you see what happens in China particularly, and now so many Chinese artists are under the gun of greater censorship. It's, it's, it certainly isn't like before Tenement Square. Uh, uh, before 89, when there was a blossoming, and then a crushing, and then, uh, 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 what is it, 1994, when the first book comes out about all these uh, Chinese artists creating work in their basement by Han Art Gallery in, in Hong Kong, then that whole thing of creating artwork that is, what, thumbing their nose in the West, a lot of it is, is like that. And being very obnoxious to the West and, and thumbing their nose at their own government. And that kind of artwork that comes out of China, which we as Asian Americans would never do. I mean, we can hardly generate uh, the kind of passion that Latin American artists have, not only in their art, but in their openings. They're out there on the street driving cars around the city. You know, that's not us. Uh, but that the dynamic now of the things that I'm concerned with is between what's happening in Asia, China, everywhere, and the kind of work they produce in Japan also, uh, and what Japan society does. To see that whole relationship evolve, and what does it all mean? Uh, we now need to, that is an incredibly important dialogue to help us understand what's going on. 
Because what happens literarily is one thing. What happens in the visual arts tells you a very different story. And, and to, for us all, as Asian, we have to be a part to understand that. And I, I'm trying to raise something that I've pretty much forgotten, which is the very, very early people. This is what Lisa is doing. We've been raising the, the culture of the hunter-gatherers as people who are alive, picking up that heritage, and creating a dialogue between how they see things and, and evaluating what modernism is. A bit about your fabulous show, The Tiananmen Square, and how you engage the involvement of Sparrow and Mel Chin and all these people, which we did it. I'm honored to have done the 25th anniversary. The, the, day, the day of Tiananmen Square, we were, the world, the globe, was looking at their TVs. We had two weeks to prepare that something was going to happen there. And so everybody's TV was glued to what was happening in Tiananmen Square. When it happened, we were utterly shocked. And so I knew the next day I was going to start a show on Tiananmen Square. And it was going to last a year. And uh, we, we figured out that uh, Big League was staff at that time. And he figured out that the way to do this is get every artist to create a door, and we can stack them up in our tiny little gallery. Um, and that was the very beginning. And so we, we knew it. Also, I can tell you that um, the, the funding for that year was multi-year, which means I didn't have to apply for a grant. I didn't have to tell Niska that I wanted to do this show on Tenement Square, because the, my money automatically was going to come for the next year. So I just blew all those regulations away and said, this is what I'm going to do for the whole year. Uh, and artists just responded. Once we moved to uh, Blue Helmet in Soho, we had this big space. All the artists told each other about it, and they all made a door. We had how many more doors at that point? And then we moved to PS1, and then we had how many more doors at that stage? And Mel Chin came in with three concrete slabs that were 800 pounds each. It took six guys to carry it up to the fourth floor, each one. Uh, of course, he takes that back. I don't have that. And also, uh, what's her name? Uh, the other artist in, in Soho, uh, who's very wealthy, sends a team of lawyers to pick hers up after the show is over. Uh, everybody in the show was brand new work meant for that show, except for Kenneth Nolan who gave us a big square thing about six or seven feet square. And then when he took it off the wall for a blown helmet, he um, gave us a small print uh, to replace it. But that big square red thing was done, you know, how many years before. Um, so this was, every artist, there was, you know, you go to Chicago and you bump into artists and they would say, oh, I had a door for you, but I did, didn't have any money to ship it to you. Uh, that's all over the place. All over the world, people, artists, were making art for Tenement Square. That's why we did this, that's one of the reasons we did the show, because this is where art and politics unite in an art event on TV for the world to see. It was a no-brainer. We had to do it, and it worked. We, got, we became the best show of the year in the art magazine of America. The only place it didn't work was among Chinese people. Because at that time, Chinese people did not understand art except it was a high note and a beautiful acrobatic thing. You don't use art, you don't call it art, that is meant to make a political statement. That was, people would say, you're collecting money? What for? Are you going to send the money to the kids? Something? We, we're trying to educate and bring this issue to the public. That was not a, a thinkable, a, a, an idea that was part of the Chinese traditional way of thinking. Yeah, another question? Hi, my name is Joanne. I'm yes. Actually, hi, my name is Joanne. Yes. I love paint. So my question for you is one uh, that's much more basic. What is uh, the Asian American Art Center, uh, what are some of the events now that are happening? Um, and does it have that bring artists who are doing work now together? I don't, I don't have a, I haven't had a gallery since 2010. 
I once in a while will rent a space like a white box to do a show. Um, but what's happening now for us is we have a permanent collection of two, three hundred works. We have a tenement square show, which we now found someone who's going to take it off our hands, thank God. Uh, and we need to find new homes for all this work. And we are working with a few museums around the country who are interested in bringing the idea of Asian American art to their students on campus and to their public in their professional museum. Uh, and um, the, the work is to bring a message to those museums that they can use to the public because we've been doing it this way, but for it to get into the mainstream on that level, and what do they say? What, what, how do they explain it? It's like the museums in Hong Kong. They don't know how to say how modern art got into Hong Kong. It's the same with these institutions now. So I spoke with uh, uh, Tsen Kwong Chi, he's a famous, you know, his picture was here. His, he, what I understand is there's only one place where you can see his work now, uh, although several institutions have it in storage. Uh, but you go to the Smithsonian and see it, and it's right next to Chuck Close. So in other words, the Martin Wong that they have is not next to Chen Kwong Chi, which means, to me, is that they're fitting these Asian American artists within the story of traditional modernism. They're not really telling you the Asian American story and are challenged to rewrite the story of America in terms of people of color and what that all is. And that means that these other museums are wondering how are they going to tell that, that story I want them to present? And if they want what I have, then I want them to make sure that they not only talk about what Asian American is, Asian American art is, and what it means to how the future of this country is going to evolve, but that it, 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 tell, that, it tell that story in, 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 with that context. And that means that it can't just be some artwork on the wall that you can walk past very quickly. It needs to be several pieces together. And so there's many, many aspects to this. I can tell you it took two years or more just to create the Google Doc that lists all these works and the information next to them and, and split them up between three or four storage locations that I'm lucky to have. Um, it's more work than I thought I'd have on my hands. It sounds like we need an Asian American Arts Museum. <laughs> Pardon? It sounds like we need our own museum. That's what it sounds like. I, 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 I wish there was a museum. I'm working with somebody who I wish they could do it. A museum for blacks, Asians, and Latinos in Lower East Side. Is that really going to happen? We're, we're, we're you know, it's something I drink about. Yeah, it's good. So, we're still lucky enough to have known you for over 30 years, or more, 35 years. This is Lotus Doe. And um, one of the things I think you're very humble about is the, the passion that you have had as an Asian American born here, which in, in your generation, our generation, there were very, very few. The passion you have had to claim being who we all are, American, first, and having the Asian part of it be a very important aspect of, as an identifier. My question is, it seems as though the Smithsonian should have this entire collection and be, and be paying for the archive and working to, while you are still viable and and here, this is the Asian Museum, Asian American Museum in the Smithsonian, which is a whole museum, should have, uh, should show the entire archive, should have it in the collection, and it should be um, documented the way you have by the funds of the United States. And just as a person who has lived the <coughs> heritage of being an Asian American. I 
think that um, it is the only, the, the smallest honor that is deserved in this archive. And, um, but this federal government where we get that to work, then we can put that on the whole agenda. They have many traveling shows. We see the, it's not free to go. It's free to folk art. It's real art. Mm -hmm. It is a real heritage that has been subjugated like every other racial um, piece of art. Why, why, why hasn't this happened like a National Museum of Asian American Art? Why isn't there a national Asian American university? We are all stuck a part of some other. But do people uh, want that? University. <laughs> uh, we don't realize we have to be independent. Where are all the wealthy Asians? Why are they giving all their money to the Met instead of to us? Uh, why are all the yes, that's not enough. So, if, but I mean, there's I, enough. There's a critical mass enough now that wasn't there in like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there's critical mass now. But for young people out there, do you, I mean, the word Asian American, the term Asian American, what's your feeling on that as a as an identifier? Do you feel a connection to it, a strong connection? No one's speaking up, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, I think I, I was born in Seattle, uh, predominantly white community. I only really understood Asian American. I was born in 1990, and I only understood Asian American as a term in like the past four years. And I think before that, it's a lot of, especially on the West Coast, it's very conflated with like Asian nationals and like you should be going back home or be going back. Like it's never about belonging to America. And it wasn't really until I think greater dialogue around people of color and that there was a sense of like, oh, I could be proud of being Asian American. But I think it's the absence of this like public dialogue in these spaces to be able to feel like you belong to something or that there's people here that have been in America for a long time. And I think it's even still shocking for me in New York to find people that are older than myself that have been born here that are Asian. And I think you, we just don't have the access or the tools of the communities to be able to feel a part of those things. And so I think there's like a hunger to belong to something. We just can't find it. I think uh, the, at, the, um, at a recent event at uh, NYU, uh, the Asian American, Asian Pacific American Studies Center, uh, Alexandra Chang started this group, uh, which is the Asian American, um, what is it, uh, online museum. It's an online museum for Asian Americans. Online museum for Asian Americans. And someone in the audience asked her, are you going to keep the name Asian American? You know? So now, one of the groups I really support and love is uh, Asian Contemporary Art Week. So Asian Contemporary Art, that phrase is going to have a life and expand all over the place. You compare that phrase to the phrase that we've used, Asian American. It's quite different from Asian Contemporary Art. Uh, it, it, its scope is quite different. And what did she, her answer? Yes, I'm going to keep the name Asian American. Because even within this larger thing, even with all these Chinese artists becoming such big, I wait, wait, whatever, you know, there is a role, there is a place for us. And Trump has given us even more reason, a greater reason to say and assert what Asian American and how we're going to defend and make a place, make a home for ourselves in this country. So within the larger international context of Asian art, there, there, is, there is a place where we can all get together and organize. All the Asian American artists out there who never got into the marketplace, never got a nod, never got shown. There are so many out there that are important. The marketplace, the, the, the capitalist marketplace for the art in this country is luck and, you know, you got written up in some white institution. It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't have anything to do with what is important, particularly to you and me. 
the, those things are are what turns on uh, the marketplace and what can make money and what brings the next wave going. It doesn't really touch upon how we live, how we feel, and what is important, the issues that are important to us. That's why we focused on our own issues and I never had anything to do with the marketplace. So I, I, I am here to tell you that the next big campaign we're gonna have is, you know, bring art home, bring Asian American art home, because it's not part of the marketplace. It's part of our community. It's part of us and who we are. It's important, if it's important to you, if you get nourished, if you look at, you feel nourished by what you see, it's important to you. If you don't demand and create an audience for what Asian American art is, there will be no Asian American art. There will be, it will die, it will be gone. It's the audience that has control. And I've seen this in so many art departments where in, in uh, what, after 1990 when the big book came out about the Decade Show, yeah. all these departments around the country were talking about telling young artists in school, art school, oh, why don't you focus on your identity, right? Or your, your, your expanse. And then now, what, five years ago, everybody in NYU, I interviewed 30 of the Asian students graduating from the art department. Not a peep about their identity. Don't touch your identity. And one student leaked out and said, oh, I didn't do identity. I, I found something to else to do. None of the other students would say that to me. It shows you how influential your education, your teachers are in school are. What is important to you what comes out in your artwork, what's inside of you. If the art schools don't help you to find that, they misdirect you. And I'm trying to point you, direct you. There will be no Asian American art if you don't find nourishment and want it. Okay, I have one. I want to ask the last question and then I think it's be done, I'm sorry. Um, but I think it's important. Um, so, Chinatown, you know, nowadays, a lot of art galleries here, uh, moving in the last five to ten years, now there's more and more, uh, we've seen uh, moments of cultural appropriation that have gotten a lot of people upset by some artists that are showing these galleries. And, you know, what do you, what's your, uh, you know, what do you think of all of this happening in the neighborhood where you, uh, you know, essentially start to define Asian American art? Asian American art is a big question to everybody from different, wherever they come from, have a different notion of what's important in Asian art and what they feel they want to bring here. So, it's a, a lot of people have their own way of seeing it. I have my way of seeing it. Uh, but the issue of gentrification and the way this economy works and how it is so closely tied to real estate is, uh, is trying to figure out how the art community needs to respond to these forces, which is why I've been working with the People's Cultural Plan for the last two years. And so you can read the plan that we created. It's online, you can sign it, you can endorse it. We're coming out with this new thing about, um, uh, about, what is it, Amazon, uh, getting artists to sign on and agree not to be a part of any promotional thing that Amazon is doing. That's a, I think that's what the People's Culture Plan is doing next. But there's also all these other developments, housing developments, that our Blasio is structuring to evict all these people in different communities, whether it's Sunset Park or on the fringe, um, and how he's going to use artists to help him do that. Like for Chinatown, he, he, the idea of closing what that prison and bringing it to Chinatown, Rikers, and then not saying a word about Rikers, but we understand there's 400 acres there. Once he gets rid of that prison, there are 400 acres there. Can you imagine what the real estate industry is ready to do 
The way our economy works, uh, and the collapse, you know, I don't know what articles you're reading, but the collapse of capitalism is right on our doorstep. And the whole idea of a totally different ethical in, uh, uh, structure, scheme, of how we're going to live through all these robots that are going to take our jobs. What kind of world are we on the edge of? And, and I'm trying to point us to how Asian Americans can conceive of their place in that dialogue. Because if, if we start looking beyond that we immigrated here 200 years ago and realize that we're connected to the first encounters, the early encounters between those who were seen as Asians then, and even look beyond that to, to these, uh, bef before that time. The dialogue that happens when you see the, a bigger human story, uh, that, that, that bigger human story, well, that's what I was going to start off with and I forgot. I was going to start off with, uh, have you heard about the, the Long Now? The Long Now is a foundation called Long Now. And it's, uh, it's created a clock that's supposed to last 10,000 years. And if you go on to Instagram, you'll see that there's a thing called um, uh, Today's um, Overview. And every day, apparently, Every day, morning, you can look at today's overview, and you have these images that are of looking at the Earth from way out there, and these details, and how, how do you suddenly see them? And it's about um, understanding the Earth in a new light, which was inspired by the astronauts who went to the moon and saw the most amazing thing was looking back at the Earth looking, seeing the Earth in a different context, in a different time span. The time span abroad to see the Earth in this broader way. I was going to tell you about my father, why I can never understand a word he said. Oh, hardly. Where was he coming from? Somehow, that generation were going back to face all the things that they faced, the, the first generation that faced what they had to face in this country. How did they do that? And I did a show of some Korean calligrapher, modern calligrapher, he came in, so I had to ask 10 or, 15, 10 or so calligraphers or artists in Chinatown to have a show with him. Six or seven of them came out of the woodwork. They were all Chinatown businessmen. What were they doing? They were painting bamboo, or they were painting insects, they were painting this is a normal practice. Then I realized even my Chinese doctor paints Chinese characters. Every day I see him doing this. They were, that generation was pulling upon the wisdom of their heritage and what they knew in order to face the difficulties in this country. They were coming from a different sense, totally different sense of time. And I'm saying to you that this country is now faced with creating new values that is generating this thing called the, the long now. Generating a different sense of time. And we as Asian Americans are going to be part of trying to re-grasp what it means to not do multitasking, not mm -hmm. you know read the, the, what's in the newspaper or the TV and forget it the next day. Our short span of sense of time is got to go. And, and we're going to be moving and learning a great deal that science is bringing us, but that in deep in our heritage is there waiting for us to, to, to uncover. And I was lucky enough to meet George Weber, and he blew that away for me.
Maybe you wanted to say real quick before we I just want to say we all work with Bob as our residents, um, members of um, founders of Godzilla. And um, you took on so much uh, at your center that, you know, you really, uh, I think, gave us a lot of um, inspiration and, uh, you know, we, we clashed and that was great. We had a huge dialogue going on and that's what I'd like to see now. And, and I think, you know, I disagree. I think young people do want to get involved. I've gotten a lot of um, comments from people just lately that, you know, Asian American is alive. It's all over the country. It's not. We can't see it. But if you if you run like, into people uh, like I was in the Midwest, there's a huge, um, you know, kind of like um, I, I don't really understand, but it's like social media, um, you know, parties, uh, you know, whatever it is, fashion, it's, it's there. Bubble tea. Yeah. <laughs> so, Thank you. Thanks, so we got we got to give a lot. We got a bunch of respect. A lot. Thank you.